So before we uh, kick right. things off, I uh, just have a little short video I wanted to show you that was uh, newly created for our experiences yes. because we are not from Utah. <laughs> oh, come on. So this is what we're used to. <laughs> beaches, did you put beaches in there? <laughs> See, swimsuits. <laughs> they didn't have Park City. So as you can see, we're used to rain. <laughs> Umbrellas are for rain, not snow. It was raining earlier. All right, thank you all for coming to our presentation, the last session, the last day, right before the party. We really do appreciate you being here today. Today, excuse me, as I bang the microphone. As you see, we're going to be talking to you today about creating accessible online course content using can Canvas. You already know our names now and where we're from, University of Central Florida. What do we mean when we say accessible content inside Canvas or creating accessible content? We're talking about strategies that um, you can use to meet the needs of hearing impaired students or blind and low vision students, such as adding captions to videos, alternative text to images. But we're also talking about applying universal design for learning principles to your content as you're creating them, such as chunking your materials, your layout and organization, things of that nature. The things that we're going to be covering today are layout and organization, headings, images, links and URLs, color, tables, and videos. John and I work with faculty and help them design and develop their online courses. And as we were thinking about this session, we were thinking about the types of things that we talk to our faculty about and help our faculty with as they're creating their online courses and creating their online content. First, let's talk about layout and organization. As you're beginning to design your wiki pages or your content for your online course, it's always important to think ahead of what you might be covering, organize the content, chunk out the materials in manageable um, chunks, provide, first of all, a title for the page. Very important to help give the um, overall organization of the page or, or idea of what you're going to be covering. We're going to look at some examples in just a minute. Section headings are very, very important, and we're going to be talking about why they're important and talk to you about some examples of those in a few minutes. If you have multiple pages, it's important that you have consistent style from page to page and that you have clear, consistent navigation, navigational structure. John kindly created inside Canvas some pages that give you bad examples as well as good examples of each one of the things that we're going to be covering today. Also, you will have access to our PowerPoint as well as the Canvas course that has all the examples in it. You, you're welcome to use it and communicate with us either through the course or through our email when the session is over and, of course, at the end of the session. If you have questions as we go, feel free to ask them as well. And John has the microphone. Okay, bad example of layout and organization. Let's look at that one first. John, where'd my switch on mouse? Sorry. John uses a Mac. I'm not a Mac person, and I have to have a mouse. So, so let me try this. I'm clicking on the bad example. Maybe. OK. All right, we're looking here at the bad example, and let's talk about why this might be a bad example. This is a content page. You're going to look at the same content in a different manner in just a minute. First of all, I don't see a title. I have no idea what's going to be covered on this page if I were a student accessing this information, or even um, an adult learner or a faculty member. I have no idea what's going to be covered. I don't see any section headings. I see an, a random image here. I'm really not clear why this image might be here. A table that looks okay, but then there's another table up here with some funky colors, some text I can barely see. All right, now let's look at a good example. If I can get used to this, using this mouse, sorry. All right, a good example. Same content, believe it or not, it's the same information. 
First of all, you'll see that there is a heading and title at the top of the page called Digital Kids. So I already have an idea now of what's going to be covered on this particular page. I have an introduction, already kind of gives me some context. Scrolling down, oops, scrolling down here, and the next section, Research on Digital Kids. I see that image now with that title or that section heading, Research on Digital Kids. I now have a better idea of what's going to be covered in this section or why that picture is there. Table looks pretty good. That other table's gone. I have a looking ahead section. All right, already much more clear, very clearly laid out. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. On the what? On the P. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm not a Mac person. On the P. <laughs> okay, the next section is headings. Now we talked about the importance of headings or why they look important on that previous page. But what you're looking at here, hopefully you can see it a little bit. You don't need to read the words, but just kind of get an idea. At the top of the page, it says Heading 2, Heading 3, and Heading 4. As we were saying, we teach a faculty development class at the University of Central Florida to people that want to teach online. This is an image that we go over with the faculty. It's in our faculty development course to help them get the idea of what headings are and how they might use them. And then below here is an example of how those three headings would be used. For example, the title would be a heading two, the section headings would be heading threes, and if you have a subsection within a section, that would be a heading four. And one of the, um, some of the important reasons to use headings is one, they help break up your content, help it become more visually appealing. A sighted user, as my, like myself, I can look down that page and I can get an idea, like we did on that digital kids page, of what's coming. I saw what the title was, I knew it was about digital kids, saw the introduction, looking ahead, and the research on the digital kids. But if I'm not a sighted user, I can use my screen reader, as long as someone uses headings, and scan a document in that same manner. I can use this, like for example, JAWS. I can set JAWS to navigate a page just by headings. So just as I, as a sighted user, can look through this page and get an idea what's going to be covered, so can someone that is using a screen reader. Yes? Oh, sorry, the microphone. I apologize. Forgive me for a fairly introductory question since I'm new to Canvas, but does the rich content editor allow faculty to pick out the heading levels? Or does yes, have to go into the absolutely. HTML when we level? go back into Canvas, I will show you that. The Thank rich you. text editor, up where the um, fonts and things are, there's heading twos, you just use the drop down, yes. Very easy to select them. Thank you for asking that. Very good question. All right, now let's look at another example. Like I said, this is an image that we use to, to display headings for our faculty to help them grasp the concept, and we also talk to them through our consultations with them. In addition to that um, image, we also offer what's called a template page for our faculty. If they're not comfortable navigating Canvas and changing the navigate or changing those headings, then they can use this particular page and they can just change out the words and remove heading two. And they're already set up for them. Like the heading two is a heading two. The section title is a heading three. And they just fill in their content and replace it. And they can use this as an example. Just really quickly, I would hit edit this page and see right here. There's the heading section where you can change them right here. So you can highlight the word and select what type of heading you're going to use. When you're, if you're a web page person, you know, normally you use the title as a heading one, but Canvas uses heading ones for something else. So that's why we don't use heading ones. Especially if you're new to Canvas or thinking about going to Canvas, you're probably wondering why we're not using heading ones. And that's the why, reason why. John, did you have a comment? Go yeah, I, I, just, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, about headings and titles. We talked about, um, we, uh, first of all, this new feature called Draft State came out just after we uh, kind of submitted this proposal. Um, so uh, if you've played with Draft State a little bit, we don't have it enabled for this course, that it takes the title of the wiki page and then uh, puts it in the top left-hand part of the page. Um, so you could have redundant titles, but we're, we, we're just gonna still tell our faculty to put a title, a heading to at the top of their wiki page centered to keep the consistent formatting. And then also, um, it'll be easier for students with screen readers because they'll be able to tab with that uh, heading to still at the top of the page. Yes, ma'am. And I 
I noticed that it was repeating the title. We started taking our title out because it was already in the, you know, the women's world one. Should we be putting that back in, back in the pot and working with the students? I would suggest putting it back. I, I understand from, Dana, are you in the room? So, so the, quest the question <laughs> is, uh, should we, we uh, at her institution, they started to take it out. The question is, should we put it back in? And then uh, we, I, we particularly haven't done any accessibility testing on, on it since it came out. And Structure but has. They've done extensive testing on it. But we would still recommend including the heading two so that the screen reader can navigate. I don't know how the um, draft state title when it comes through, what's that, what it's included as. Because if you go to edit a page, you can't change that. It just appears. So I would recommend still including that heading two for the screen reader navigation. Yeah. Oh, Dana, do you know the answer to that? What it? Okay, <laughs> okay. Dana's so, from Instructure. She's also the um, Canvas, a Canvas accessibility guru. So we're lucky to have her in the room today with us today. She can get the answers for us. We had another question. <laughs> yes. Code for what? Can you bring in the microphone? Code for? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. We use a code for the page name that is indicative of what it is, like CCP for continuing, you know, whatever the oh, name of the page is. We just shorten it to a code, and that's what shows up at the top. And then we okay. can still use header two for the actual name. Oh, that's a great idea. Thank you. Did you? Thank you for telling us about that. All right, and the question before I go on to talk about images, and then John's going to talk about links and URLs and do the rest of the presentation. Okay, images. Um, one of the things about images, they're very nice to use in content. They help break things up. They help make things visually appealing. But one of the things you want to be careful about as you're designing and developing your pages for your classes is to try to avoid, as tempting as they may be, adding purely decorative images. Because if you're either a sighted user or a non-sighted user, those decorative images can be very distracting, can be very confusing if someone starts looking at them and trying to find out why they're there. It's also very important to include alternative text on your images. And while I was preparing for this presentation, I started looking at definitions of alternative text. And there are a lot out there, all very similar. But this was one of my favorites. It's from webaim.org. If you're not familiar with the organization, it's a great organization to learn more about accessibility. It's webaim.org, great organization. They have lots of information about making things accessible. And their definition is, for alternative text, provides a textual alternative to non-text content in web pages. So if you were a non-sighted user and you got to an image, what the screen reader would read is what the alternative text is. So what you have put in inside the image as the alternative text is what the screen reader is going to read. Um, and I'm going to show you an example in a few minutes. Canvas is really nice that it always has an alternative text area, but it defaults to the name of the image. So it's good because there's something always there as alternative text. But usually the name of the image isn't always descriptive enough, usually is not descriptive enough for someone who couldn't see the image to have an idea of what that image really meant and why it was in the course. Okay, so it's always important to think about why you're putting your image in and think about those types of things as you're coming up with your alternative text. All right. Um, also, as I was saying, alternative text is good for people with visual impairments or important for people with visual impairments. People that have chosen not to view images, people still do that sometimes. They want to speed up how even as quick as the internet is these days, they still turn off their images many times. But they, use, they see that alternative text then. So then they can scan, read their pages and skim it if they wish and still have an idea of what they might be missing because they have their images turned off. Also for those who don't want to load unsecure content, also important for them as well. Okay, let's look at that example that I was talking about. Let me find my mouse again. What? Down, down, down. <laughs> I seriously cannot see this. It's, it's got the PowerPoint here. There we go. Here. OK. All right, this is a really nice example, another great example that John put together. Oh, Oops. To the that was weird. Hot corners. <laughs> There's a reason I don't have a Mac. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. 
All right, here, this page has a good example and a bad example of alternative text. Remember our digital kids that we were looking at a little while ago? John also had um, these, what JAWS would read for each of these images recorded so that you could get an idea of how it's going to sound to somebody that is not sighted. Okay, so here's the image, the bad image, or example, I should say, of, of alternative text. I hope you can hear this okay. Graphic kids dash tech dash revised dot jpg. Yeah, we had sound. Visual person, video person, do you know what happened to the sound since the Colin. movie? <laughs> or Colin, excuse me. As they figure that out, I can tell you this particular alternative text example just has the name of the um, the name of the image. Here we go. Graphic All I mean, I couldn't understand that honestly. I, I got the j dot .jpg part, but the rest of it was pretty foreign to me. But what we did was we put the text. You normally wouldn't do this, but just for an example, this is what it read. Kids hyphen tech hyphen revised dot jpg. So that still didn't tell me why this why this image is here. What is if I couldn't see it? What is being uh, tried to be portrayed with this image on my content page? So if I was not sighted, I would be very frustrated not knowing what I was missing. All right, let's look at a better example of alternative text. The same image with a different alternative text, a more descriptive alternative text, I should say. And again, the text is below. If you can see it, I'll read it in a minute. Graphic one boy and two girls sitting on the couch with a smartphone, tablet, and laptop. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> no, thank you for saying that. John, John put this together. It's fantastic. Um, you heard that alternative text. One boy, two girls sitting on a couch with a smartphone, tablet, and laptop. That's exactly as a sighted user what I see when I look at this image. And I have the context of the article and the section headings above it. Or this was the digital kids and the research on digital kids section is where this image was. So it's very important to have not only have alternative text, but have it be descriptive enough so that someone that can't see would understand why the image is there and what they potentially might be missing. So they don't feel like they're missing anything, hopefully. All right, John's going to be coming up and talking about links and URLs. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. So I, I just wanted to put a cap on, um, on images um, that alternative text, and if you do some research on universal design for learning, um, they're going to start using the terminology descriptive text. So it's actually going to be more than just a brief, uh, just a brief intro of the image. It's actually going to be a sentence or perhaps two sentences. So we're getting beyond just the basic description into a more, uh, into a very descriptive text. So I wanted to talk to you about a brief change that can make a huge impact on users, both sighted and, uh, and, and unsighted. Um, for instance, with just pasting in the URLs, um, and I'm going to show an example here in just a minute, just actually kind of like the, uh, the alt text, just put in a little description and then hyperlink that phrase, because that's going to be a huge benefit not only um, for how the screen reader interprets uh, links. And um, so for instance, like the UCF homepage versus just click here as well. Notice click here is just very generic. And I'll show you this with the example right here. So for instance, same, uh, same content. Notice how the link is like this, and now we're going to have JAWS read it to us. Tabs kit and this paper growing up digital. Quote link links to an external site. HTTP colon slash slash www.xu.edu slash meridian slash jan 98 slash feed underline 6 slash digital dot HTML links to an external site. Says the student. <laughs> so would you like to hear that? <laughs> so that's the bad. And then let's listen how Notice that I have the term growing up digital hyperlinked. Donald Tapskit and his paper link links to an external site. Growing up digital links to an external site. Quotes as these students. So for instance, it just read the descriptive text, but it still notified the student that it was a link so that they know to actually go 
and it can be clickable. So I just wanted to show you small changes, mm -hmm. big impact. Good point. So I wanted to talk to you now about color. Um, color, uh, question, yes. Just to clarify, that was just linked text, right? I mean, that was just yes. That was just linked, you, that was just yes. linked text. Yes. So um, because what it does is in the anchor tag, or in the, um, in the tag in the HTML, it had the, uh, the actual link text, the href, and then also beyond the href, it has the actual text that it displays. So if you just leave it normally, if you just copy and paste a link in, it automatically defaults to putting in that link text as the, quote, descriptive text. Um, to color, don't use color to convey meaning. You want to use italics and you want to use bold. Um, I don't really recommend underlines because underlines uh, have a different meaning on the internet. That's to link to something. So you don't want students actually clicking on an underlined. And if it, the text happens to be blue, then they're thinking they're clicking a link, and it's not, it's not a link. So you'll actually get an email, hey, this doesn't work. Um, also, try and keep text colors to a minimum. You know, we don't want just bland pages, but you don't want MySpace pages either. Um, and then also, it, it's very important to have good text and background uh, color contrast, and I'll talk about that uh, right now. Um, has anybody heard of the WebAIM color contrast tool? Okay, so few people in the room. It's a great tool. I'll just open it up real quickly that you can go in and you can paste the foreground color, which is your text color, and your background color into this. And it's going to give you a rating based on internet standards. So it's kind of, I like to call it the, um, it has a double A and a triple A rating. I like to call it the motel versus the hotel. <laughs> so think of, you know, the, the triple A score. Would you rather stay at a motel or at a hotel? Hotel. Hotel, of course. <laughs> so I'll go back, to, uh, go back to the PowerPoint. So the criteria for a normal sized font, so something of about 12 or 14, um, the, it's going to be 4.5 to 1. So that's the, the ratio. Um, and I'll show you some examples here in a second. And then for a larger text like headings, um, it's a little bit smaller, the ratio, because the text is bigger. So um, it's a little, they're a little uh, less stringent on that requirement. So let me go and show you um, some colors that are available now in the Canvas Rich Content Editor. And if you can't even read the top one, so I, I went through the color tester and kind of said fail. So these are under the, the 4.5. So you don't want to use yellow. I forget this is some, torp, some type of lime. Uh, orange, pink, red is, Red has its own set of issues. So kind of in that, that double A rating is in the good area, so blue, dark green, and purple. And then, of course, the best is over seven, which always seem to be the more duller colors <laughs> of um, burnt orange, very dark gray, and of course, black has the highest. Um, I tested everything against white because Canvas comes as a default white background. And at our institution, uh, we don't have any custom CSS to change the background colors for our faculty. So if they want to change it, they'll have to kind of figure it out themselves. So a lot of them don't do that. Um, but I just wanted to uh, show you some numbers. And uh, like Nancy said earlier, this is uh, publicly available in the course that will give you um, the link at the end. Any questions with color? Okay. So text, Canvas. Um, Defaults uses a Helvetica font, um, which is sans serif, which is one of the best types you can use. So you don't really have to worry about that unless, um, you're, unless your system admin does a lot of custom CSS. And that's a discussion that you want to have with them. And also, um, I don't, can anybody read the second bullet? Yeah. Yeah. OK, but barely. <laughs> Notice how you're straining. Um, yeah, so if you're in the first couple of rows. So you know you can. The default is 12, so do 12 or 14. Don't make it any smaller than that. And then also the consistent coloring, don't make it like a MySpace page. And then, like I said before, 
uh, the text um, just have a good um, color ratio for the background versus the foreground. So tables. Who has had trouble with tables in the rich content editor? Okay, a lot <laughs> of hands. So tables, number one, should be used for data, not for layout. You can use CSS for layout. And if you don't know, if you don't know any CSS, um, talk to somebody at your institution or there are some great uh, training courses online. Uh, column and row headings can be added in MS Word, but one of the things that we found is that it's not copied over to Canvas. We have a lot of faculty create in Word first and then bring it up and then copy and paste into a, a wiki page. However, the, in the code, um, the table heading tags are not brought over. Um, so you actually have to go into the HTML code. So in the rich content editor, you still have to hit switch views, which I know for some people is very scary. Uh, so, uh, and actually put in code. Since we're running short on time, I'm not gonna go do that. But there are examples of, um, on, our, on our page. I'll just click the example. Um, I had a question. Is Canvas working on that? That's a great question for Dana, <laughs> which she can address that towards, <laughs> towards, the, towards the end of our, our presentation. So for instance, we did the same thing with JAWS. Um, and then also down at the bottom is actually the code that you would copy and paste and insert into there. Since we're running short on time, uh, I won't do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the, the comment was, for those of you who have an iPhone or an iPad, you can go into the accessibility mode on the iPad or iPhone and then see exactly what, um, what, what's, what, what the students would see. So um, to kind of wrap up our presentation, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about captioning. Um, first, I want to talk to you about scripting. Scripting is actually the very first important part of the captioning process, because you have to have something to caption. Uh, we always recommend to our faculty to start with a script first, especially if you're going to come into our video studios, we require for you to have a script. We have a teleprompter. So that, that helps us with accessibility right off the bat. Plus, faculty aren't fumbling and stumbling and doing multiple, multiple takes. It's actually much more time consuming in the studio when you could have prepared ahead of time and know exactly what you say. And it's also easy to make updates and edits. And then it's also much, much, much cheaper than paying a transcriptionist. <laughs> so with captions, the, definitely the benefits of captions, um, there are some with, if they have learning disabilities or if you're an ESOL student, we have a, we have a significant uh, international student population at the University of Central Florida. So Canvas does allow you to upload multiple tracks where your students can actually be can actually view captioning in different languages if you provide it in different languages. So that would be great for a uh, uh, language courses. Um, also, if you have an engineering course, difficult terminology, any of the health courses, and also for convenience. Has anybody ever turned on the uh, subtitles on like some of the earlier Harry Potter movies <laughs> where just the accents were so thick that I just couldn't understand what Ron Weasley was saying half the time. <laughs> so, or if you're in a loud environment and you don't have headphones, that's another great way to, so think of it as a universal design principle mm -hmm. instead of just, it's something I have to do for somebody with a hearing impairment. So in our presentation, um, Canvas does, uh, has a closed captioning tool called Amara. It's not created by them, but they link your video file out to their and use it. Um, so um, I've got re we've got resources for that here. Also, a quick cheat is upload your video to YouTube, and it'll try and interpret your video. It's kind of like if anybody has Microsoft Outlook uh, at their institution, and you try to uh, um, do the speech to text with some of the voicemails, and some of them were really funny. Um, but I've had great success with YouTube, and it's it gets you started. And then uh, you can go through and just make some edits instead of just sitting down and typing out everything. So thank you very much for coming, especially with the, with the time period. Um, all of our materials um, 
including this presentation, are available in our course. All of the examples, go in and look at them. It's a public course. And um, any, any questions? I saw a hand in the back. We'd be happy to talk to you more about the table section, either after presentation or after this, or at another time. Also, we have our business cards up here if you want, but you'll have all the contact information up there as well. Yeah, in the, in the back. Yes, ma'am. How do you uh, handle uh, comp uh, captioning while using the conference tool? That is a great question. Um, we, uh, we, actually don't, uh, we actually use a separate product, Adobe Connect, so on, on campus. Not everybody has a license, but whoever does, there is a captioning pod in there that somebody can live caption. So in that type of situation, uh, we would know ahead of time, and we would, instead of using Big Blue Button, we would work with our Student Disability Services Office and, uh, and set that up. Question up here? This is actually kind of a, well, it's kind of a, it, it's back to the header thing, mm -hmm. um, but. Hi. Um, just, just back to the header thing for draft state. Um, I just checked draft state. Um, it's um, so it is an H two. So the so oh. for you guys, and it actually works. Um, I checked it with VoiceOver and stuff. So it actually is accessible, kind of out of the box. So if you just name it, um, okay. that you're good. Great. So that means we'd have the two heading twos. You, you would have you would have two heading twos. Yeah. So um, if if it's thank on, you yeah. for um, checking that. Great. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for checking that. Yeah. <laughs> Sterling, I work with Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sterling. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, ma'am, up here in the front. Oh, just a quick comment. When we turn down draft state, a lot of pages that have tables, the tables and the pages, mm -hmm. that tends to be the default draft state. Yeah. 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 Yeah.